So I think uh, regional blocks, the emergence of a multipolar world, we're definitely in a different place now uh, than we were last week. What does the war in Ukraine reveal about South African foreign policy? We discussed this question and others in a recent CRA client webinar held exclusively for subscribers of the CRA. What follows is a short extract from this webinar featuring Terence Corrigan and Nicholas Lorimer. Enjoy. Uh, is that uh, merely a, a hangover from the old Cold War loyalties? Uh, what is South Africa's strategic interest in, in abstaining from this vote? Look, um, my, my take on that, and this is not, uh, this is not always a, a, a well-received position, is that it is a mistake to see this as, as uh, a hangover of, of, of historical loyalties. Uh, what this uh, that it represents that in part it represents a certain geo uh, but it also it represents certain geostrategic and ideological commitments on the part of the South African government. Um, I the ANC put out a statement saying that this this shows that the Cold War uh, that the Cold War never ended. My response would be I think that for um, many within our ruling party, no, the Cold War never did end. Um, and I believe that uh, there is a very, very strong strain of what they would describe as anti-imperialism, which in, within that ideological framework must be understood as imperialism is something that comes from the West. A country like Russia does not engage in imperialism. It is an anti-imperialist, or at least it's pushing back against imperialism. Ukraine wanting to join the, um, uh, wanting to join the EU or NATO, that is an expression of imperialism. Russia uh, uh, seeking to prevent that is justified self um, uh, 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 self defense. So nothing nothing at all surprises me about um, about South Africa's position, except for that initial statement by the uh, by the Department of International Relations and Cooperation that Russia should withdraw, which seems to mm -hmm. have been uh, uh, you know in short order. Um, uh, withdrawn to a position that we must understand that the bombing of the Donbass region was absolutely dreadful, and uh, you know the UN Security Council must intervene. It's all it's all boilerplate. Um, I and I think that may, you know maybe this this uh, this dreadful conflict can have some sort of uh, redeeming feature for South Africa if it can prompt some sort of mature mature discussion about what uh, what actually does drive our um uh our foreign relations um i I've think shown the here bricks um the image from the last BRICS summit terence uh, yeah. do you think that i mean i'm a bit skeptical of BRICS uh, in terms of its institutional power uh, uh, it was a, a term coined by jim o'neill uh, of yes. goldman sachs uh the kind of the 2010s to describe these kind of large countries, significant populations. Uh, South Africa wasn't in there, but was kind of lumped in to represent Africa. Does it have any look, significance in terms of global politics? Look, it's a it's it's a it's a forum for deliberation. These are large these are large economies. Um, uh, uh, South Africa aside, which can potentially uh, agitate for things like. Uh, the reform of of the various architect um, architectural features of global governance, uh, but just looking at this, you have um, uh, you have the sort of modern technocratic totalitarian state in China. You have uh, sort of machismo populism in the form of Brazil. You have uh, 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 Hindu nationalism in the form in the form of India, and you have uh, and then of course Russia. The less said, the better, perhaps. And then uh, uh, South Africa, whose economy is dwarfed by is dwarfed by the others. I think it was Anthony Butler who made a remark about BRICS uh, about ten years ago, saying that it's something that Jacob Zuma can go to because it makes a feel like states like statesmen um you know for south africa to fit into something like this we would just have to do much much better uh you know in terms of our own uh, uh, uh growth prospects and, and 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 developmental achievements but you know for the uh, for the moment it, it's it's a it's a it's a club that that uh, you know we certainly are very proud to belong to whether it means we're, we're, I'm, I'm not sure it means it means overly much Nicholas, can I bring you in here? Uh, are we seeing perhaps the beginnings of the emergence of a multipolar world just to close us off before we go into Q&A? Uh, definitely. I, I think that's definitely true. Um, one of the things we've seen from this conflict is how the EU from much 
uh, been quite willing to take, particularly the big countries like um, Germany, uh, took a, a very much a back seat um, when it came to a lot of foreign policy stuff. They would uh, provide aid, they would give money to various developing countries, um, but they weren't particularly interested in hard power. Um, before this conflict, Germany, despite expressing its support for Ukraine, only sent helmets uh, to the Ukrainian government it didn't really believe in supplying arms, um, as did non-NATO countries like uh, like Sweden. And what we've suddenly seen since uh, February 24th is an incredibly quick turnaround in the foreign policy of many of these big European states. Uh, they have suddenly adopted a much more aggressive approach, and Germany has announced that it is planning to make sure that its military is rebuilt. It's currently in a very weak state, and that it will continue to spend more than the NATO requirement, uh, that's 2% of GDP on its army for a while going forward. So it does seem to me as though Europe has sort of awoken from a, a stupor it's been in since at least the end of the Cold War, um, and is taking, it no longer believes that sort of American military power is enough, that it also needs to take decisive, decisive actions and act very much on its own. Now, France has of course been doing this for a very long time, um, but with uh, much more of the EU kind of adopting the same position in, in Germany in particular with its uh, massive economy, um, I think that Europe may very well uh, come to be another pole in the world, which I think is not perhaps what uh, uh, Putin expected when uh, the invasion of Ukraine was launched. I'm sure he expected that Russia would be able to establish itself as, an, uh, as another pole in opposition to America and possibly also even China. Um, but it seems that Europe is coming into play now. Of course, we're seeing a growth in the, the Chinese economy and massive expansion in the Chinese Navy, which I believe in the past couple of years has actually outproduced the US Navy in not just in terms of ships, but also tonnage. Um, we're also seeing an enormous amount of military technological development in China. And India, of course, is also becoming uh, more assertive on the world stage, although its foreign policy has been complicated by this current conflict. So I think uh, regional blocks, the emergence of a multipolar world, we're definitely in a different place now uh, than we were last week. And I think that a multipolar world is much closer than it was before. And um, Terence, uh, Deneo in the chat says, how will the geopolitical conflict affect South Africa from an economic and consumer perspective? She's saying uh, Russia is the world's third biggest coal exporter. To what extent can SA coal producers benefit? I mean, also Russia, I think basically 90% of uh, the world's platinum is in either Russia or South Africa. So, uh, you know, with uh, platinum exports constrained from Russia, maybe there is a, a potential yeah. upside for South Africa. Okay, I think uh, from, from our point of view, the big risk is um, the sort of inflationary pressures this is going to this is going to put on us. Um, Budget Review talked about inflation, I think, of four point eight five percent or something, which means a great deal for people whose uh, whose incomes have already been been hammered over the last couple of years through the the pandemic and just the chronic unemployment. Um, I think that let's say the sort of upside opportunities, uh, as you say, the gold, platinum. Um, in, pr in principle, yes, but I do caution everybody that South Africa's policy environment is not, condu is, is not, is, is not wildly conducive to, um, uh, to investment in mining. Remember, we had, the, we, we had the commodities boom and our receipts shot up, but our actual output, very, very, um, mm. very, very mildly, we haven't had much exploration for years. So, you know, if, if, if South Africa can get its internal act together, you know, and I, I say this, you know, with all, um, with all deference to the very real human suffering that's going on, yes, there could be, uh, there could be advantages for us, um, uh, 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 for us to exploit. That is, if we as a country and the government that, uh, uh, that presides over it, uh, will act in a manner that 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 will allow um, will allow business and, um, and 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 entrepreneurs to do so. Thanks for watching. What do you make of South Africa's foreign policy position towards the conflict in Ukraine? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, if you would like to access the full recording of this webinar, you can do so by a becoming a client of the CRA or b becoming a member of this channel. There is a link down below where you can join us for under 100 Rand per month. All of our events are live streamed there and the recordings are also uploaded for posterity.
My name is David Ansara. This is the CRA. Until next time, take care.